Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live recording session of the On The Board podcast, edition number 78, which will be going live, uh, well, as soon as I introduce everyone, really. Um, so that's all very exciting. Uh, apologies if I look like I've been sat in this studio study for uh, 48 hours. That's because I have. <laughs> but it's been, a, it's been a fun 48 hours, uh, definitely especially when you had two days off booked anyway. Um, so yes, we've got a great uh, podcast lineup uh, tonight. Um, I can show you them, but I, I like this bit if I show you them, but keep them muted. <laughs> there you go. Uh, they're all going to wave. It's a bit like blankety blank. Or I need a, I need a more recent um, reference. Oh, Phil, look, he's deluded because he's a new dad. He's got no idea where he is. <laughs> Never mind what day it is. Uh, so I'm going to say goodbye to them. Uh, but that, that's going to be really exciting to have those guys on uh, and are making a debut as well, which will be great too. Um, we're obviously going to talk about two new signings and stuff like that. <laughs> um, there were a couple of games we need to catch up on as well. Um, for those of you who know, we'll of course do wits end at the end. So keep that to yourselves, but hang around for it. Trying to think of, well, we're still thinking about players whose songs were better than they were, which seems a bit harsh. And I have got a couple of, I've been a bit short of planning time because of the new signings, but I'm going to try and dig out some um, uh, messages, which I think I got. Um, so hopefully I'll have a look at those. Um, get your comments in um, if you wish and any questions. I'm expecting there might be quite a few tonight because obviously it's been a busy couple of days. Um, we'll do our best to pick out the odd one as and when. Um, Steve's going to have a go at doing that. So that's going to be exciting, but we're sort of trialing doing that. Obviously bear in mind the pod is essentially an audio product that's going to go out on those uh, on those streams, but um, we'll do our best to at least make the video interesting too. Uh, but don't worry too much if you don't include all your comments because uh, I will be bringing back the green room at some point soon over the coming weeks, which is basically my video Q and A. So we'll have that uh, to look forward to as well. I reckon we crack on and, and get on with the pod, shall we? Um, I feel a bit out of practice, so this could be this could be more random than the first one we did. But let's see how we get on. Hope you enjoy it, enjoy the podcast, and uh, well, yeah, see you on the other side for some fun. Right, get the script ready, and let's crack on. Hello all and welcome to the 78th edition of On The Ball, a Norwich City podcast that is pumped for Farker's football war. It's Michael Bailey here, I cover the Canaries for The Athletic and I hope this finds you safe and well. On the way, £70 million, Mateus's 12-pack and Quebec of the net, Norwich done ins. Uh, Leicester and Bournemouth still happened, and at least we're not Arsenal fans. We will work through all that and more with our guests this fine August, just about evening. They are Norwich number one chief at NCFC numbers, also known as our very own Steve Sanders. Hello, Michael. How are you? Very well. Thank you very much, Steve. We've also got BBC Radio North presenter and new dad, so go easy on him, Phil Daly. What day is it? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, on the ball debutant, City fan and budding journalist and programme seller, I forgot to put that one in, Anna Say. Hi. There we go. They are our panel this evening. Thanks uh, so much for joining us, guys. Uh, Steve, how are you doing? A top job on the hosting last week, by the way. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, missed you, obviously. You know, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> you make it look it well. Actually, to be fair, I didn't do the whole. I didn't do this whole live bit, so it was quite. I had it easier, really. Um, Charles Charles Dickens pun run. That's all I'm saying. I wish I could produce that sort of quality. Yeah, that's uh, that's what people were calling for. You know, that's what they thought. Michael just doesn't reference Charles Dickens enough. So uh, you know, give the people what they want. That's, that's what I was like. Well, you nailed it, and it was a terrific pod last week. So well done, um, Philip. How lovely Hello. to see you. Uh, you. Obviously, for the audio listeners, you are currently set up just as you pop up on my computer when we have a Daniel Farker press conference at Colney. In, in by the way, a room you built yourself. 
Yeah, I mean, this is actually where um, the, the breakfast bulletins come from on BBC Radio Norfolk. So I'll be here tomorrow at six o'clock in the morning preparing might as well for, sleep for, there. for sleep there. I might as well, actually. Yeah, I mean, I probably could. <laughs> I mean, sleep this is my, in, in fact, if I did sleep here, I wouldn't be with a screaming baby. So it's quite a good idea. Well, there we go. We are changing lives on the On The Ball podcast tonight, which is great. Lovely to see you, Phil. Uh, Anna, you're in a resplendent Norwich, looks like a baseball shirt. New, my fancy new jacket. I just wanted to show it off. It's very cool. Well done. I think the club will, th will thank us for that as well. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us on On The Ball. I'm great. I'm looking forward to it. I've got plenty of opinions to bring. Well, good. You can dish those out and spread them on the Norwich Faithful. I'm sure they'll, they'll enjoy them very much. Um, it's part of why we're here, isn't it? I reckon we uh, should crack on with uh, this week's headline act, which is still short of a sting. But let me get that sorted um, uh, for the international break. Just give me a tick, for goodness sake. Um, there is no other place to start, really, than what has been the last 24 hours, ending just a few hours ago with Norwich's ninth signing of the summer in terms of centre-back Ozan Kabak. Uh, they made their eighth signing of the summer about this time on Sunday night with the arrival of defensive midfielder. Yes, you heard right, defensive midfielder Matthias Norman from Rostov. Both are on loan. Both have the options of permanent deals. Both could total um, twenty. £5 million pounds worth of business, I think, if Norwich A, stay up, um, because although they're not actually dependent on Norwich staying up, the, the fact Norwich could afford them probably is. Um, uh, and um, yeah, permanent deals possibly if Norwich do the business, which if these players deliver, Steve, what I guess we're all hoping they can and their background maybe suggests they could be able to do, then we'll be laughing. Yeah, yeah. If they're both Laughing. absolutely brilliant, then uh, we'll be on our way in, in heading into Europe, won't we? Um, I think. I mean, I'll be honest. You know, as you know, I'm a massive fan of the Russian league, and I watch it regularly, particularly Rostov. Now, I, I don't really know a great deal about Norman or Kabak, um, but I think it's pretty. I think it's a it's a widely held opinion amongst our fan base that we needed a defensive midfielder and we needed a centre back. And I think it's probably clever business to get them in on loan rather than commit ourselves to a huge fee. And um, I read your article on Norman this morning, and I know it's not necessarily conditional on us staying up as to whether we sign him permanently or not. But you've got to think that we ain't signing if we go down, no matter how good he is, at £11 million, whatever the figure is. Um, but yeah, it's, it's exciting. I mean, I was trying to think the last time we signed two loan players on the same day, and I don't know whether that was going back as far as Huckabee and Crouch, but um, it, it's, uh, it, it has that kind of feel to it because they're two players that could change our season. And certainly, as far as Norman goes, I can't think of another transfer where there's so much resting on him being a success. Um, you know, we'll talk about Leicester um, shortly, but that that game we we so badly needed the, the assets that he will hopefully be able to bring um and quite honestly i can't see a midfield without that kind of player this season and us being a success so we absolutely need him to hit the ground running um and hopefully he does i've no idea but um hope seemed to be high so i mean it, it did feel um it did feel anna as if it got to the point where norwich effectively just need we almost wanted them to sign any defensive midfielder because it was that it was that sort of gaping it felt what what the hole was so I guess to a degree as long as Matthias is is kind of competent at his job surely that would be an improvement for the 11. Well I you'd think so I mean I like a guy who is sure of himself and confident about what he can bring to the, to the team and I seem to get that vibe from him when I watched his um interview and I just think that it was one of the few things that all Norwich fans could could agree on because we could have the best centre backs in the world, but without that protection in front of them, they're not going to be able to hold out for 90 minutes. So it was a, a big hole to fill from the good old Ollie Skit from last season. And I'm just hoping that he's the guy to fill it. I mean, I suppose this is this is the point um from me writing the piece that uh, Steve um Steve sort of re referenced there, which is on the athletic, by the way, um, on on on, Mate on Mateus. I've got to say Mateus, Mateus. Uh, Phil was this 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 idea that um, that as a as a defensive midfielder, it's just going to need to be someone who's fairly competent, and that is quite clearly a hole in the in 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 the team. So I guess yeah, finger, e even if he has maybe been given a bit more time and space in in Russia, you'd like to think that 
there's something more, more with Norwich to play with. Yeah, you'd hope so. I mean, he, I think he is the most important signing of the window, really, isn't he? Because you talk about all of the, the quality Norwich have got. And, and we talk about all the different players that can move around. And, you know, I, I think Kenny was brilliant at, at the weekend. But, you know, he can play in so many different positions. You, you want someone who just does that job. That's why we used to love Alexander Tetti. No ideas of grandeur, really. The odd one now and again. But, you know, just do your job. Just, just stay in front of the back four and, and do your job. And that's why Ollie Skip was so good, really, wasn't he? You know, great engine room. Um, you, you talk about him being confident, Anna. With that haircut that he's got, he's got to be confident. I mean, the amount of players who used to get abuse for wearing white boots and he's turning up with the uh, silver hair, you know. Uh, I don't know. He's, 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 already, he's already a favourite of the lady fans. I'll play that. <laughs> Well, sure I mean, I mean, none of us would have clothes on if we looked like him. Let's let's be quite <laughs> clear here. I have to be, um, I have to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I had to reference Ollie Skip in my athletic piece because it feels like that's kind of the obvious comparison that all Norwich fans are looking for. Really, they want someone who can do that job. I mean, it does. And again, if I felt this, it does really emphasize uh, Phil the. The, the, the hole that Ollie has left because of what he's gone on to do with Tottenham, that's almost like the added extra, isn't it? Not only has he gone on and started every Premier League game for Spurs, but by the way, they've also won them all. And by the way, they're top of the league, which is which yeah. is nuts. And I mean, it's interesting watching him because as a, I, as people who with good memories will know, I was kind of questioning whether he was ready for that step into a Spurs team. And actually, it, positionally in the way, he's, the way he's going about the job, you can see he's still quite raw for a team playing at that mm. level. But I guess everyone else around him is kind of keeping that ticking keep, keeping that ticking over with him me, me too I, I thought exactly the same I thought you know he's, he's a Premier League quality player but but is he a, a top four Premier League player at the moment you know I, I fully believe he'll go on to be at, you know probably at the very top of the game being England international but I, I did think at the moment is he you know is he just going to sit on the bench every week for Spurs and, and we know that he, he can play every minute of, of every game so I, I'd love to know how long Norwich were hanging on for to, to just see if Spurs were going to continue to give him a go. And, you know, let's be honest, it's a brutal business, isn't it? If he hadn't performed in the first game or two of the season, he might then have been cast aside to, to go and get more regular game time with Norwich or, or someone else. But, um, yeah, he, he is definitely the person who needed to be filled because he was just so good last year. And, and, and let's be honest, we're always talking about, you know, the back four or the front striker. So it, the glory ends the field. But yet he was so good at doing what he needed to do last season. And that allowed everyone else to do their jobs properly. And, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it more. But, you know, there's going to be, and there was on, you know, Canary Call from our side of things at the weekend. Oh, is Gibson still good enough to be in the Premier League? Should he be taken out? Well, whatever level of football you play at, if your back four is exposed constantly to Premier League strikers, you will concede goals. So that's why someone in front of them is just so important. I uh, I wanted to just make that last Ollie Skip point because that, I hope, is the last time we ever mention him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just in terms of it being done now. Um, but I was thinking the other day, it should be lovely when he comes to Carrow Road with Spurs. I hope that, you know, the Norwich fans give him the uh, the, the thanks that he, that he deserves. Um, maybe up until kickoff and then leave it there. But I might come on to that point later on as well um, on a different matter. Um, so M Matthias Norman is in. That's exciting. He is away with Norway over the international break. So quite what happens with when he comes in will be interesting. And we may well talk about that in a bit. Uh, that was Sunday evening. Um, read a piece on The Athletic about that because I've gone into quite a bit of detail in terms of how that's happened. A real interesting uh, fact that Norwich have, have gone down the patience route of getting a higher class target than maybe they would have done two years ago which i find really interesting similar really with with ozan kabak who i think um i mean it's remarkable really and how this this you know norwich were linked with a player like this yet no one really knew about it until a day or two ago when basically he was on his he was flying into norwich and 12 hours later so by that point it's kind of like norwich are, are pretty were pretty much there i was trying to work out whether he was coming in to have a look around or coming in because they kind of got it sorted and, and could finish it off. And it was, it was the latter, which kind of surprised me in a way. So um, yeah. Uh, what do you make of this one? Because this, this is it. I just a signing I didn't expect Norwich to make in terms of the quality. Well, I'm certainly quite happy with this one. I think it's a, 
a nice problem for Farka to have because every, everyone's talking about now constantly on like Twitter of who their preferred starting lineups would be. And everybody's got a different idea. Everybody wants a different player in there. And to have Quebec there, I think it's brilliant. Because not only will he bring the quality, he'll hopefully push the others to up their performances as well. And I'm wondering now, like, should he start? But then do you drop Gibson and Hanley? And where does that lead somebody like Zimmerman? It, like I said, it's a it's a nice problem to have. And it really felt like that final piece of the puzzle. And like everybody said now, there's no excuses. It's down to them now. They've got to do put out the performances. Yeah, it's. I mean, Ozan has a free... Well, I don't know if he's away with Tur- with Turkey over the international break. I'm not actually sure, to be honest. Um, but uh, that will be what that is. He he's played on both sides of a centre back pairings, and he's I think he's predominantly right footed. But he he made all his appearances for Liverpool while on loan last season uh, on the left. I mean, uh, again, there's another piece on the Athletic looking into to Ozan's sort of uh, recent background, especially which is quite interesting because I think there's this perception that he didn't do very well at Liverpool. And in reality, he had a difficult start, but he actually did do quite well. And it was more a question of them wanting to go for a target in Canate that was going to cost them £35 million uh, and, and then having enough options to kind of not bother with, with Schalke. So, um, and that's in a Liverpool team that kind of recovered. And also he played in the knockout stages of the Champions League, Steve. I mean... Now he's, at Nor- now he's at Norwich. I've already had some of my editors sort of uh, suggest that he, uh, you know, he was expecting a Champions League club to come in and it didn't. So that's why he looked a bit miserable in some of the pictures, to which I, I sent them a picture of him with a big smiley face on saying it wasn't true. It, it, it does feel like a coup. Um, I, there's, there's a part of me that I think let's reserve judgment. I don't want to pour water on anyone's bonfire here because it, it, like, you know, it is the kind of player who we don't normally sign he is a name that i think people recognize i was just looking at who he'd been at before though and he's 21 and he's been relegated twice already in the bundesliga oh, stick. come on steve himself. hey you know I, we can't we can't all just be giving you know i love it That's but, why you're but, here. I, I think i look i clearly the potential's there um but at 21 years of age i to me i still think he will only play it's the same with gibson and Hanley. I think they'll only be good if they've got that good defensive midfielder in front of them. And I think the Gibson and Hanley partnership was brilliant last season. I wonder if it's just been a little bit exposed because of the lack of Ollie Skip. Sorry, I've mentioned him again. Um, so that's why I feel like the Norman thing is key. I'd say Kabak's ceiling is almost certainly higher than any other centre-back that we have at the club and probably allows us to play with a back three, which is something that I think Fark would maybe quite like to do this season, but perhaps doesn't have the confidence in our current centre-backs to do that. Um, but I don't know. I want to reserve judgment just because I don't think he's going to be the kind of centre back to come in and organise the defence. Um, I think, but I do think if we can integrate him in, give him a bit of time, which we may not have, then I think we could see a really good player there. Yeah, it will be think, really interesting. Go, Phil. That's the. I think Steve's absolutely spot on. But you know, you don't need him to organise the defence when you've got Grant Hanley there, do you? You you need him to do the, the, the dirty work and maybe. I mean, I say that the leg work, but Hanley's one of the fastest players we've got, despite the fact he doesn't always look look like it when he's running. Um, I, I think yeah, Steve's absolutely spot on. The, the only thing I'd say different from the Liverpool side of things is. That's the difference between Norwich City and Liverpool, isn't it? Liverpool need a centre-back that is Champions League quality right now. Norwich need one who's fourth from bottom in the Premier League. You know, that, that realistically is, is, is what we need right now. And he's got the ability to be much better than that. And, you know, maybe one of the top four clubs would have, would have bought him and stuck him in the squad. You know, Norwich have got hold of him and we'll give him game time. And that's always the card that Norwich want to play, don't they? With with young players who have got the ability that they, they will, you know, hopefully touch what he says, but but give them game time. What I, what I would say just to add to that as well is I think now if we do stay up, you know, with these two players and we do sign them permanently, we've we've got the potential to have a you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. I know we're currently 19. I can't, it, I, I can't oh, see yeah. you. You're so far ahead. I can't see you. <laughs> um, so... But if we do finish fourth and bottom or wherever we do finish, um, I think, you know, they're building for the future. Um, I, I think it's been an exciting window and, and this has finished it off quite nicely. 
It's definitely done that. Um, I did throw out the figure seventy million pounds at the start, um, just to uh, offer up the my fag packet con, uh, calculations. Um, that was basically uh, Yanulis and Gibson's permanent options at the start of the summer, which haven't really been included in this in this uh, in this summer's budget, but they they have come about this summer in terms of paying out. Then all the signings, and then what Norwich have committed to pay if they stay up um, and take the options on these two. I mean, it's. Still a lot of money. I've never known Norwich to even go anywhere near committing that amount of money. It obviously includes thirty-three million quid that they've made from uh, that they made from Emmy Buendia. Let's not forget that too. But still, um, we should probably add the the other news today. Melvin City's contract mutual termination. He has he has left the club. That was uh, on the other end of the scale. Really, a, a cheap, risky uh, deal to see if some if it would stick, and it didn't. So <laughs> it didn't work, and everyone's moved on. So that will almost certainly be the last mention of Melbourne City. I would have thought uh, Norwich also uh, done ins in terms of done with all their ins. So I don't expect anything else now. Obviously, because Daniel Farker's got enough issues getting all these players in. He doesn't want any more to have to worry about. Um, by the same token. Um, I wouldn't expect anyone of um, significance to leave now as much as some um, young Arsenal fans are determined to suggest that Max Aarons is, is going to be a is going to be a deadline day target. If you think Norwich are selling him in the final 24 hours of the window, um, I would be I would be uh, amazed. So um, are we all are we all really happy? Is it, is it are we at a window where we like I don't know if there's anything else we would want done? Bearing in mind, I suppose, we are still reserving judgment on the business, Phil, that has actually been done. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's what we love about a transfer window is we get excited about all the players we've brought in. But um, as Norwich fans, and we don't need to drag up the names, we've been burnt before, haven't we? So, you know, uh, this is this is the one time that we can talk about how excited we are before they kick a ball. Um, yes. <laughs> and, then, and then we can worry about it uh, as we go through. I mean, uh, you know, uh, some of the signings they have brought in, you know, and we'll talk about the cup game very soon. Yeah, there, there were moments where they looked good over the course of the Premier League season is where we'll find out whether they're, they're, they're Premier League quality or not. And, and if they are, and if they're as good as we hope they are, you know, looking at that squad, it's been a very good win day. But, you know, we just won't know until it happens because, you know, as I say, we've, we've been burnt before. I was We were looking back to last time we were in the Premier League and we, we talk about how Norwich really didn't recruit. Well, actually... At, at, during the summer, we did recruit a few players that we did start to get excited about. It, it's only in hindsight that you've forgotten all about them. You know, we were talking about it at the weekend. Amadou, Ibrahim Amadou came in and he was a player who was valued at X million and, and had this experience. And yeah, he, he spent a lot of time playing out of position, but, but he was hmm. awful as a, as a defensive midfielder. So let, let's just <gasps> wait. Whoa, I don't know if I'm going to have that. I don't know if I'm going to have that. But He wasn't good, was he, Michael? No, well, we, when, when did we, when did <laughs> we see him as a defensive midfielder? Yeah, when did we see him? For yeah, for, <laughs> for 30 minutes at Southampton, where, to be honest, everyone was rubbish. So, uh, um, you know, but yeah, yeah, a uh, point taken, certainly. And I think there is. it does bode well, maybe, that the certainly these light, latter two signings feel like Daniel Farker really wants them and would maybe get stuck into them. Maybe that wasn't quite there with Amadou. Uh, Anna, is there anything you would have liked from this window or are you sort of all there? Well, for me, it, that really was the final piece of the puzzle. You look at all the positions that we felt needed to be addressed and they've addressed them all. Obviously, like everyone else has commented, we have to wait until we see what they can do. But at the moment, it doesn't really feel like Norwich could have done much more in terms of really giving it a go. I think certain pundits out there can't exactly say that we're not giving it a go this time because this is the most I've ever seen them give give it a go. And I'm, I'm really excited about it. Well, you say that, Anna, if they can get 100 uh, likes and retweets off the back of it, they'll still say it. Don't worry. Um uh, well, there we go then. Um, we'll, we'll cut off any any suggestion about Max Aaron's. Obviously, the uh, the transfer window closes at 11 p.m. on Tuesday. Um, I'm not envisaging having to do any work like the last two days over the next 24 hours. So take that from me. Um, we'll we'll see how it how it goes because there are probably still some players in Norwich have signed where I'm a little bit um, reserving of judgment still as well, which probably brings us um, on to the Leicester game if we can. Norwich is third. Uh, Premier League defeat, <laughs> just to bring everyone back down to earth. It's a bit like um, you defrosting your freezer today, um, Steve. We've got all the cold water now to pour left over to pour over our heads. I mean, yeah. um, the Leicester game. Where did you where did you see that? Because I 
I, I'm a little bit torn and I can see both. I could see a quite scary first 25 minutes when Norwich were getting completely overrun and being left sort of 5v3 whenever Leicester chose to counter and playing at a completely different tempo. And then I saw the sort of last 50 minutes where Norwich really competed and probably, to be honest, should have been allowed their equaliser. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> probably about mm. right. Um, I mean, the first thing I wanted to say was I, I found the whole thing like so enjoyable. I mean, obviously not the result. Like, take, take the result away <laughs> and the VAR away. I love those games where we're sort of underdogs and it feels like the crowd need to get behind the team, but we're, we're still in the game. Liverpool kind of felt like we were never really, you know, we were, well, as soon as we went 2 0 down, it was, it was over. Whereas we were in that game right until the very end. So I thought it, and the first half was like incredibly frenetic and end to end, not great quality, but it was, it was a, a really entertaining game. And, and exactly, you know, that's what being in the Premier League is all about for me. I, I think you pretty much have summed it up, really. I, I think we played much better um, and it was heartening to see us compete. But I haven't really seen that much of this as a narrative. I'm glad of like, well, Leicester came fifth last year. So, you know, it's a tough game and they're a good side. They didn't play that well, I didn't think. And I think if they were to play like that at other teams who are going to be around us in inverted commas, I think other teams would get points from from that. And that's the problem really is because it's a playbook that we were reading off a lot a couple of seasons ago. We played quite well. We gave away silly goals. We didn't take our chances and we kind of let teams off the hook. So it does feel like a missed opportunity. And yeah, I, I kind of came away thinking should have got something out of that. There were, yeah. The two things I'll pick up on there, Phil, um, because it, it's, it struck me that I came out away from that game thinking, well, Leicester are going to do very well to get anywhere near where they finished last year. And I know they had issues. I, I thought actually in the first 20 minutes, they looked like a side trying to kind of prove a point having been thrashed the previous week. And I thought they had that zip about them, but I thought they did lose that. And in the second half, they kind of, they struggled to find anywhere near the same tempo. It was only really one attack that got them, got them, all three points and I didn't really like and I was thinking about this when Steve was talking about Quebec because he is only 21 I didn't really like the fact that Daniel Farker kept referring to the fact that he had young players and they're going to make mistakes because I don't want the narrative all season to be well we've got a young team so they're going to make mistakes because ultimately I, I know that he wants to play young players but I, I don't want the excuse I want them just to learn really quickly and be good <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it depends who he's really referring to when he says that. You know, Williams made the mistake. Well, you know, he started loads of games for Manchester United at the end of last season and you've brought him in and played him in front of someone you've spent millions of pounds on. So you, you obviously fancy him enough to, to come straight into the squad and do well. So I, I totally agree. That that excuse will only last so long, won't it? And, and how many times have we said about Norwich City? If you make a mistake, you can't keep making the same mistake. And, and again, it was especially for the first goal, getting in down uh, the Norwich left-hand side and getting the ball in. And, you know, his centre-halves are not uh, spring chickens, are they? And they were backing off and gave, you know, players like Jamie Vardy far too much room. So, yeah, I mean, overall, I was really heartened by the performance. Leicester weren't great, definitely. They certainly weren't at the levels you'd have expected from them. Um, especially after the first 20 minutes or so. But as Steve said, you know, that the joy of football is the the ups and downs, the roller coaster of it. And there were there were some ups. So it depends how um full you want your glass to be <laughs> and whether it's half empty or half full. But I I can see it from both sides. I, I, I really enjoyed the game. I felt like Norwich deserved the equaliser. Um and that would have felt quite different had it not gone against them with VAR, wouldn't it? I think a few people would have been feeling a lot more positive. I, I don't think there's much we can argue with in terms of the VAR call because he was offside. I would like to see an image from the other side of the ground to see exactly where the Leicester defender was because you can't see if a player's level if they're behind the player ball behind Todd Campbell and then a bit of me just thinking oh if Todd had just taken half a step back <laughs> just as someone's about to head it he would have been on side it would have made no material difference to anything Casper Schmeichel was never saving Kenny McLean's header and we'd have been all away but can I, can I just make the yes. point sorry to jump in before I said anything mm -hmm. on the game but um my issue with VAR I mean VAR is always right and and people who who then it's the same with the Liverpool Chelsea game with the recent James handball I kind of think 
you can't you can't argue with an, an official who's qualified to know all the rules and will, will they will always get that decision right by the laws of the game. So quibbling over that stuff. I mean, I didn't really think our penalty was a penalty, but yeah. it was given. So there you go. The issue I have is that I thought the the delay for the penalty completely sucked all of the energy out of the game at that moment. It was about three four minutes where we were just kind of after you know a fairly kind of end-to-end 10 minutes before that it was like okay now we've got to stand sit around and wait while the penalties and I didn't really like cheer when the penalty was given and then the goal gets disallowed at the end and I kind of feel cheated because I was like I celebrated that goal I wanted that to be a good moment and it's been taken away over you know I know people said this a million times about VAR but it's been taken away over a matter of inches and it was right, you know, great, well done, we got it right, but <laughs> not football, sorry. That... Steve doesn't want right, he wants Norwich to just score regardless. The, 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 the issue with that, I have, is if you ignored VAR, actually that goal would have just been disallowed by the linesman's flag. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I remember... I, yeah, he did okay, flag, well, and yeah. I, mean, I saw. What, what a call by the linesman, though, because when, when you have to <laughs> yeah, the VAR and say it's within, you know, a centimetre, well, and the linos go, oh, yeah, Mark, yeah, easily, easily. Again, done. again, I haven't seen whether the Leicester player is level or not, and I don't really know how anyone's made that decision, because all I've seen is one side where all you can see is Todd. So I don't know if he's, I mean, bearing in mind what we were drawing lines with... <laughs> You know, it could be anything sticking out from him, to be honest. It was on side. Exactly. (laughs) Who knows? But there we go. It's all part of the fun. Um, Anna, I mean, how did you feel at the VAR moment? Oh, how long do you have? (laughs) (laughs) Not that long. That that was a difficult one because, like like Steve said, you you feel cheated, you celebrate that moment, and all of a sudden it gets taken away and you're just waiting around to see whether you can carry on celebrating whether you feel deflated and it was a hard one to take and I mean it must have been hard for the players because they celebrated as well and nobody could blame them for letting their heads drop in the last few minutes because that's got to be hard to take I mean I think anybody nowadays would rather sit in the pub after a match and complain about a bad official than have a VAR decision taken away from them by the matter of inches yeah yeah, this is true. Although I, 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 I still would rather have VAR, I have to say. But maybe that's because I'm not in the stand paying money. So uh, maybe I have to get my head around that one myself. Um, Anna, let's. Um, were you at the Bournemouth game as well? Yes, I was. Wonderful. Well, let's let's just wrap up that. Bit. I mean, six nil. Lots of positives from that. I know we didn't get to see uh, Christos Jolis on uh, on Saturday because of a calf injury, and and he'll be here rather than in Greece because of that now. But hopefully, he he won't be too long back uh, the other side of the international break but um nice couple of glimpses from him and first goals for josh Sargent. and you know what could be better reward than a home tie against liverpool in the fourth round it's third re- round it's redemption don't worry about it <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a wonderful it was a wonderful occasion wasn't it at carrow road absolutely and what i really loved about the team was it was a team that was playing like they were uh, desperate to be in the starting lineup and it doesn't matter who you're playing against you can play with desire and passion and you can press them and you can force the errors and you can go in for those 50 50 balls it doesn't matter who you're playing against and it made a nice change from the man city game i know yes it was against man city but the thing is like in the first half of the man city game all i saw was standing off parking the bus, letting them come at us. And it was a completely different match when it came to Bournemouth. I know two different teams, Bournemouth's second team, but passion and desire and intensity doesn't change whoever you're playing. It was, uh, it was amusing because in my head, I, I know Steve Cook had been mentioned to me once or twice over the summer um, as a potential centre-back recruit, which which seemed less laughable after they got, um, you know, knocked back by Gary Cahill, which is all seems a hilarious conversation now Norwich have signed Ozan Kabak. But um yeah, watching Steve Cook again for, for Bournemouth on, on Tuesday night was was kind of a bit wince inducing, especially by the end, where let's be honest, Steve, they kind of gifted Norwich three three goals. But yeah. you know, great, great for Josh Sargent. I think that was a uh, you know really good for him. And you, you even against Leicester then you could see there was sort of a, a spring in his step as he bounced on the pitch as a substitute. Yeah, goals um Four, five, and six were pretty terrible. I think they all resulted in ball. They were all from Bournemouth players, literally giving the ball to our yeah. attackers. 
Uh, <laughs> Neyland was one of them as well, wasn't he? So I wonder if he just got confused um, as to who was playing for at that point. I mean, yeah, it was great. And I thought um, Cholis looked exceptional. Um, oh. Although I did think, to be honest, our best player was on the night was Brandon Williams, who then made a mistake within the first 10 minutes <laughs> of the follow-up game. So I think um uh, have to take it with a slight pinch of salt. Um, I did tweet about this after, but um, pe- and it was a good crowd, wasn't it? Over 20,000. But people have yeah. really got to start going to these games if they want to see Norwich score goals, because we've scored uh, three or more in the last eight home games in uh, Carabao Cup game matches. I suspect that will end after the... No! The- it might, it might not. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being glass half empty again, aren't I? It, I, I? it might, but it also might not, of course. But yeah, I, I mean, it was a, it was just, it was nice to see them really turn up and just and the new players clicking. Um, and Phil mentioned Kenny being great on Saturday. I thought Kenny was brilliant on Tuesday as well. A fantastic game. Well, that was kind of the key, wasn't it, Phil? I think that probably got him his start yeah. against Leicester because it was the first time since his injury where I thought, oh, there he is, there's Kenny, because he'd, he'd been struggling, to be honest, since coming back, which is fair enough because it was a nasty little injury. I thought he was absolutely fantastic on, on Tuesday night. I really do. I, I think he was the player of the match. Um, he, he pulled the strings in midfield. He was, you know, you could see he was just, he, he's one of those players, one of those guys that you know adores football. So to be back playing professionally again, you know, after his injury and missing out on the Euros, you could see how, it's like, you know, kid in a sweet shop type of thing, being back. And it was a sweet shop as well, wasn't it? Because, <laughs> um, you know, I was getting overexcited at one point because of how good Norwich were. And then I was being reminded that I didn't recognise half the players on the, on the team sheet for Bournemouth. They, they were awful, but... You know, Norwich have played awful teams before and lost. So, you know, to go out and do the business, you, you can only play the players in front of you. And and to, to do what they did was great. You know, I thought Cholis was good. Um, I, I didn't think he was exceptional on Tuesday night, only because I think it might even have been during one of the goals. You know, he missed a one-on-one from the, from the left-hand edge inside the box. And you think, actually, those are the chances in the Premier League you need to put away because Norwich wouldn't have got the second ball and got the ball in the back of the net. But, you know, first game in England, I'm not going to pick holes, really. I'm, I'm really excited to see him. I'm disappointed he got that calf injury because it would have been great to have seen him in the weekend. Yeah, um, it's probably a, a good thing that Milot Rashica is, is looking like he's growing into his role and that probably gives a little bit of time for, for Christos to get himself right, which will hope, hopefully happen over over autumn when uh, Norwich got some very interesting Premier League fixtures coming up. Uh, but that is the action summed up. We've done a good job there. Right, um, as we approach the end of the first half, and I appreciate they're not really halves this week, so let's just take it as where we are. Uh, let's try to uh, maintain our concentration with our new feature on On The Ball. That is, pick that one out. Yeah, still no sting. Uh, This is our new section. It's definitely nothing like the one we uh, used to do last season. Basically, the podders will get a 30-second window to bring up an issue uh, that they're struggling to let go. If uh, the buzzer goes, which I've got uh, here, I'm I'm fully prepared. Hope you all heard that. Uh, If the buzzer goes, um, you have to then move on, and we'll move on to someone else. Uh, That will take us about 90 seconds I think, if my maths is correct. <laughs> yeah, I think it, oh, it's been a long few days. Um, good. Hope that all makes sense to everyone, including me. Um, Steve, fancy going first? I get to go for, well, I've already had my rant about VAR, haven't I? So I have to talk, I have to talk about Oh, yeah. Else. I can't fit oh. that into 30 seconds because that's... Um, have you got yeah. another one? Yeah, yeah, I've got... A, I've got. A, it's not really a rant, but um, it's... It's a all right. Just pick... Tell you what, Steve, I'll pick, pick it that out. one out. Yeah, nice. <laughs> um, okay, I'll start then. Um, so, yeah, I, I just noticed that we've not had much possession in the last two games, and uh, that good, very much goes against how we played last season. 22 out of 24 games last season, we had more possession in our home matches. Um, this time, we had less possession against both Bournemouth and Leicester. I wonder if that's bad for Tamu Puki and the way he likes to play. I'm not sure whether his movement is going to be appreciated as much. And I think it might be that might be good news for Josh Sargent in that we're like looking to get the ball up the field quicker. Uh, and that's all I have to say on that matter. Thank you. At, at least he scored. <laughs> at least Tamu got his first goal, albeit from the penalty spot. Great yeah. penalty, by the way, as well. Um, Anna, would you like to go uh, next? Can you uh, pick that one out? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit more off the pitch stuff today. I'm going to talk about. What what you I think you could it's I hate the word, but you're gonna call them happy clappers. Oh 
Well, Go I'm for not- it. Time's running. Out. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm going to say that I personally think that more people should be what you call happy clappers because I can't understand the people who, yes, yes, we played some big teams. Yes, we played Man City, Liverpool. But I can't understand the people who go into those matches and go, oh, yeah, no, we're probably going to lose this one. Oh, yeah, we'll lose that one. No, I don't know if we're going to stay up. Because... Imagine if the players did that. Imagine if the players just went into a match and went, oh, probably lose this one. I just can't understand that. I go to every match. I, we could be playing Barcelona. I'll be like, well, you never know. We always stand a chance on the day. And I just think that it makes football so much more enjoyable to go there and believe in your team and believe that it doesn't matter who you're coming up against, you're going to get the win and that the players we've got, they're going to do well, they're going to succeed. Good work there. Uh, well, uh, well said, Anna. I mean, that that filtered. I gave you a little bit of extra time, by the way. I let that run. I, I was, I was. Must my, have been a good full, point. Must have been a great Mike, point. I was full, Mike. Mike Dean. Just uh, my arms are out, playing, play on, play on. Um, yeah, it was a very good point. And uh, well, interesting that this debate kind of came up with James Madison, isn't it? Because some fans really did take exception to <laughs> James Madison being applauded off when he came off as a sub. <laughs> um, but also some people seem to take exception to him being booed, <laughs> which happened after that. So I thought, you know what? I don't know if I really care about that bit, but um, I just it did amuse me um, with that. I don't know. It doesn't really affect anything he did at the club, but well said, uh, Anna. Right. Um, Philip, can you pick that one out? I will try, Michael. Um, Spare a thought for Norwich City's best bit of business the last time they were in the Premier League. Sam Byram, arguably still the best left back at Norwich City. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) Since they've signed Brandon Williams, Demetrius Yunelis, Barley Mumba's even getting a start there. I mean, I'd love to know how injured he is at the moment, but I, I remember him in the Premier League last time. He was one of Norwich City's best players in the Premier League all that time ago before he got injured in the game against Liverpool. Poor guy. I just feel sorry for him. He's still got to turn up to training every day. Yeah. Well, Phil, well said. I, it's, um, I don't know where Sam Byram is at, but it, it feels like everyone around him has just gone, oh, I don't know when he's going to be fit. So it's we don't know. And that's all that really, which feels really sad because he's such a lovely guy. And yeah, I know having interviewed him back uh, like what, a year ago, two years ago, um, that this is the last place he wants to be. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and he's had yeah. a real difficult run with his injuries. So, but you know, it, remarkable as well to think that he hadn't actually played left back before until he played there for Norwich and then he displaced Jamal Lewis <laughs> so was, he wasn't absolutely. even first choice when he uh, exactly. basically cost it, was, 18 it, was, it was only what he proved when he did come into the side I don't think anyone expected him to we were all focused on Jamal Lewis who we knew was going to be a star and he got him out of the side you know he was he was playing really well and he's been gone ever since so it's just a shame for a, for a young well, a youngish footballer who was sort of looked like he was on the way to good things Hopefully, hopefully somehow it comes good again. He should have scored about four goals as well. I think he had, even in the Southampton game, he should have scored about three times. Yeah, that one at Villa as well. He had a really good chance at the end at Villa Park. That away. Yeah, that. that's true. Yeah. Um, I think that's all I've got. Um, I, I just wanted to add that I've, I thought Daniel Farker got his changes pretty right on, on Saturday and actually both teams I've been quite happy with as well. It will be interesting if he starts fiddling with his shape because I think there are, uh, there are interesting... Um, uh, issues is that the right word with the four three two one at the moment? I'm I'm kind of uh, curious how that um, how that shapes itself. Maybe as much for Tamey Pookie as anyone else, like uh, like you were saying before, Steve. But well, didn't, didn't he say that there's going to be some more variety in how his systems are going to happen this year. Well, I, I I thought there would be, but so far all we've done is changed the system and then stuck to that, which wasn't quite what I was banking on. So we'll we'll see how uh, we'll see how it evolves over over the coming weeks. Maybe maybe that's what this transfer window is all about. By the way, there's a piece coming out on the Athletic on that over the coming weeks uh, or the international break. Um, okay, well I think um, Steve, do you reckon pick that one out? Raging success. Uh, raging, absolutely raging. raging success. Yes. He's, he's absolutely raging at how successful that was. Um, in that case, uh, I'm going to call that half time because obviously it's half time. Uh, so let's bring out our half time sting. I mean, to be clear, this isn't half time because we've been going about 40 minutes and we, we, we aren't going to have a centrefold this week because we basically had to cover all the action and then the shenanigans of the past two days in the transfer window. So um, we are here now where we are, which is basically ahead of an international break, which um, 
I've not really been too fussed about. To be honest, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how see how um, Matthias Norman now does uh, away with Norway. Obviously, because it'll be the first time we'll watch him with eyes as Norwich City fans on him being a Norwich City player. Um, Jolis Christmas Jolis won't be with Greece. I said he's out with a with a calf injury. Milot Hrishitsa is the only Norwich player that would have been scheduled to play in a red list country because Kosovo would be to play Georgia and still are. Um, I think the plan is, well, I'm not sure if I've seen this confirmed anywhere yet, but I believe the plan is that Milot will join up with Kosovo, will stay in Kosovo for their two home games, but will uh, say goodbye to the rest of his squad as they go off to Georgia, which in my mind still throws up the point that his whole squad are going to Georgia and then joining him back in the same bubble. <laughs> really don't know if I want to get stuck into that, so let's just go over it yeah. and just hope everything's fine because <laughs> that's kind of what we've learned from the last two years, obviously. Um is there anything anyone else wants to say about the international break? Who's le who's left to go training? This is what I want to know. Oh, we're, we're there, Phil. We're there. I was going to say, what's Daniel Farker going to do? He's going to have the cones out by himself. It's difficult, isn't it? Because it is a transfer. It is a tra it is a uh, you know a break where he's done pretty well in the past. I've got a few stats in my head about that, but I'm I'm keeping them for this piece that's going on later in the week. Um, but you know he has a pretty good record of his first international break, and um, and then. Likewise, he must. Well, I think in the past he's been able to bring players in that he's been able to work on for two weeks. But you know that there are few players that he's really going to have that chance. I mean, I would normally have said, Steve, oh, it's okay if Timmy Pookie goes away with Finland because you know the new striker we brought in could probably just slot in and be ready to go. But he's going to be in the US, so he's got an even longer journey to to comprehend in Josh Sargent. Well, I think, so you've gone on. Go on. I was going to say, I think it's a. Uh, Blessing and a curse to have so many internationals in a team because you know they don't get into to their international team for just nothing. They they've got to be doing something right. But then obviously every time they go off, everyone's like, well, "Don't get injured. Don't do this. <laughs> just be careful. Don't play if you can help it." So I think all of us will be watching very closely to make sure that they all come back unscathed. I mean, I don't want to blow the lid on your athletic piece, but somebody actually did ask me about our record in uh, international after the international break. As long it as they're the same figures, then I'm not wrong. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of us might be wrong. Um, <laughs> well, now I can't even remember. I think it's something like it's something like and under Farker, we've played sixteen, won eleven, drawn four, and lost one after international breaks, which is quite amazing. And the one was in his first season. So I, I, I make us unbeaten after international breaks, uh, even when we're in the Premier League. Read it for is... yourself if you want. That's fine. Oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, they're the most I had as well, yeah. That very, sounds, very sounds about right. Um, yeah. and, and we're not normally great before the... I think we've lost more than we've won before the international break. So I don't know if that's an omen or whatever for, for Arsenal. But um, yeah, he must be doing something right when he's got the players on the training ground. So those, those four players that are left, He'll uh, he'll will be absolutely fantastic. It's not even Jordan Hugill now. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, who um, who had a very good start at West Brom, um, at least in terms of how West Brom are. I uh, spoke to our um, my colleague who covers Fulham, and he was saying how Fulham should probably walk the Championship. And I must admit, it's probably worth noting just the the, the gap chasm between the Championship and the Premier League is greater than I've ever seen uh, off the basis of last year and the Premier League campaigns either side of it that I've experienced. Um, does take us neatly to Arsenal, doesn't it, Anna, where, you know, they did a great job of showing just how not so awful Norwich were at Manchester City by being even worse. Uh, I mean, they I know they spent most of the time down to 10 men and they were a little bit lively in the opening exchanges, Arsenal, but I mean, once they can see defensively, they I thought they were worse than Norwich, to be honest. They were absolutely all over the shop. And, uh, well, that bodes well, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, I've got this horrible thing in the back of my mind going, along come Norwich, team needs result, team plays Norwich. But, <laughs> I mean, I'm hoping that they don't sack their manager until after we beat them, because then they'll be like, oh, can't beat Norwich, see you later then. <laughs> But I don't know. I just think that we've got a really good opportunity to get a result against a big team. And I just think that we need to go there and just go for it. I mean, I've 
I've seen this kind of result so often that, you know, Arsenal rock up. They've still got so many good players. They could quite easily just turn in a three, four nilla and, and away we go. And it's like, what was all the crisis about Arsenal? And, and oh, look, they've look at all these things they've done to turn it around where actually they've just turned, turned Norwich over, uh, which is obviously a hideous thought. I hate that. Um, I mean, Arteta will still be in charge. I, I think that's been pretty much confirmed by by my colleagues. Um, so that's that's one thing. I I mean, it does feel like an opportunity, I have to say, Phil, for, for Norwich. But I don't know how much I can you know, give myself the room to believe it. <laughs> yeah, I feel exactly the same as you. You know, we're, we're of a similar age where, you know, Arsenal are Arsenal, aren't they? So you, you still feel like they've, they've got the players that are going to do it. You know, you said Xhaka was sent off in that game. I don't think Pepe played at all. You know, if if their stars are fit, it's always going to be an uphill battle for Norwich City. But but why not? You know, the, 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 the Norwich have earned the right to be in the Premier League, and they're above Arsenal in the table. So why not? Let's just let's go for it. I'm going to miss the game that day because I've actually got to do Kings Lynn Town against Dagenham and Redbridge. So <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm going to be trying to watch it somewhere near Kings Lynn, I think, and and just I don't know. It's 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 one that you just desperate for Norris to get off off the mark but it, it you know it's not a relegation six pointer I don't think because uh, you know you you would back Arsenal over the course of the season to make their way some way into mid table but you know it would be great if it wouldn't it be a great story if it happens I think is there a deg- is there a degree Steve of this being about the team that wants to prove a point or is it just going to come down to ability I don't know. I, which, we, which team wants to prove a point? Both of them, I guess. Yeah, 100%. I mean, like Norwich haven't won a game yet. They've only they scored from open play and everyone thinks they're going to get relegated, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying yes, so I think we're going to get relegated. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly worried now because um, after what Anna said about being people who are defeatist, because um, I have a horrible feeling about this. I really don't see us getting anything. And that... I, I, that's not the way I feel about this season. I actually did feel fairly. I felt like we would get something on Saturday, which obviously we didn't. Um, but I, I just think Arsenal will have that point to prove, and I do think they've got good players. And I think they were outmuscled by Brentford and Chelsea, and just purely outclassed by Man City. I just feel like we're going to be too nice to them, and I really hope I'm wrong. But I think if we allow them space, um, then they could punish us. But I completely agree with Anna's point, and I'm not normally one who's particularly sort of gung ho for away games. I think they've just got to go for it. No fear. Go out there, see what they can do in the first 20 minutes, see if they can grab themselves a goal. Arsenal are weak defensively. I don't have Xhaka. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. Um, but I, I think that's the way they're going to win this or get something out of it. Then it's not going to be a nil nil. So you've got to go out there and see what you can do early on. Um, but my gut instinct is that it's going to be that three or four nil that you mentioned. And that's purely based on the experience of what we've had in the last couple of years. The, the, the one thing Norwich do have this time, and it's, it's a funny place to go and watch football anyway, because that, that crowd is never, never seems particularly happy ever or particularly united in my experience. And it can be really quiet or they can be really grumpy that Norwich have a great opportunity if they can do something early to, to really make, it a spicy place and it could become could become really tricky for Arsenal to deal with it but Norwich have got to have the gumption and the guile and like you say Steve the, the strength really and bravery to be able to create that situation never mind the actual ability as well so uh yeah I think we're all in a good place after that I think we're just sort of saying <laughs> let's be realistic and crack on <laughs> which is you know what we do best I did have a, a flick through the um I flick through the forthcoming Premier League fixtures and I think it's uh, it's obviously Watford at home after Arsenal. Then it's Everton away, Burnley away, Brighton at home and then Chelsea away, I think. So, you know, I don't want to start getting into the pick your wins out of those forthcoming fixtures, but yeah, that's the Premier League, isn't it? Nothing feels particularly uh, and, and, and winnable. Don't, don't those fixtures just show you how important it is to have that physical presence in midfield. Watford, Everton, Burnley. I mean, those you know, Everton under Benitez, those three games, they're going to need a, a, a Norman putting himself in there. That's what I'm hoping he's going to do anyway. Roll out the tanks and this 12 packs. That's yeah. the way to do it. Um, yeah. Well, that, that, that will do it really nicely, I think. Um, we haven't had a chance to check through any of the comments. Um, so I'm... Um, 
we could have a we obviously uh, had, while we're recording live on video we get we get a few comments through so we've had we've had a couple of interesting ones there's one there's a couple i thought you might be able to possibly shed some light on michael um oh, alex yeah. asked, what's going to happen with closer sold or mutual agreement and we did also have a question from jeff pool about um Poheta and what might be happening with him so don't know if you're aware of um any any movements with either of those um so i'm not aware of any potential movements for either although it may be that they they are among potential outs i think norwich are, are at the point where tim closer isn't going to be involved so it's like what are you going to do you need to get yourself a, a club i don't think they're particularly close to doing anything in terms of a mutual you know uh, termination which would at least allow tim to sign for someone while the windows um uh, closed um if they got that done before the deadline um the deadline passes so that's a potential one option but i don't think i don't feel like there's anything particularly close but you, you never know things might happen quickly um and Poheta, i mean it's been really difficult for him because obviously he's been out with the effects of covid which has made life quite difficult for him i think norwich will be keen to loan him out but i don't think they necessarily really want to sell him because he's still young and there's a bit that they maybe feel that they could do with him it's probably slightly different to anel hernandez's situation he's gone to middlesbrough on loan but they probably would have sold him if the right deal had come along so um we'll see with shemek um but again i don't think there's anything particularly close at the moment but i am anticipating there might be the odd thing confirmed over the coming days and archie may may go out on loan and things like that so we'll have to see what what happens but um yeah uh good questions with and that, that, yeah that was it wasn't it happy days or a, another one steve i can check one more you for well this one might be one might be one more for uh anna or anna and phil to comment yes. on but matthew bell asked hi michael all the way over in australia this morning who do you feel are going to be the losers in all of our signing activity i i suppose the uh he means who's who's not going to play perhaps as a result of who we brought in today good question well, I think Phil? Zimbo really. I think he's the he's the big loser when it comes to centre halves because um, Andrew Bomadelli is the future, isn't he? And I, and I think you know Daniel Farker is, you know, we know he's always gone with youth, but he he does rate him. He really does. Otherwise, he, I think he would have gone on loan already. Um, it is possible, I suppose, he he might go out on loan somewhere to get some more experience, but. I, I guess it feels like with some of the players that have already left, a bit of a changing of the guard. And I'm not quite sure. In my opinion, Zimbo would probably be at the bottom of the pile when it comes to the centre half. I was going to say, I think it, it's, it's difficult with those because as much as Farco, he, he does like going with the U, you can't just get rid of all the more experienced older players because you need them to guide the younger ones and to lead them as we've seen quite a few times I mean in, with Zimmerman I don't think it would be a bad chance to say that he certainly could come in as backup should worse come to worse and we have a load of centre-back injuries again and so uh, I think he's reliable to do that and also you know that he's going to be off the pitch, he's going to be an absolute leader and he seems very respected. And I just don't want him to go anywhere because he holds a very special place in my, place in my heart. Oh, yeah, I don't think he's oh. going to go anywhere, but I think as far as playing time is concerned, he, he, you know, he's, he's probably further down the list now. I have to say midfield is going to be absolutely fascinating because it, you, you have to assume Mateus Norman is going to start as the deepest midfielder. Uh, I don't see Billy Gilmore being able to compete with him if he really is this this sort of player that we all think he is. Um, nor should he be able to, because I don't think Billy's been able to prove himself in that role, certainly not as a solo, whether the two could work as a pair, potentially. Well, I, 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 guess there's, I guess there's an option to move Billy slightly higher up the pitch, which I think is something I've spoken about before. But then you've then only got one other position. Kenny McLean looks far more athletic at the moment than Pierre Les Malou, from what I've seen. And, and Pierre seems to have quality, but I think he's just maybe struggling with the intensity at the moment, but maybe has the potential to reach it. So, and also then has a lot of experience. So that if it's only going to be three in that central midfield, that's fascinating off the back of Norman's arrival. Sorry, Anna, you were going to say. Well, like you mentioned, I saw a few suggestions of maybe putting Billy a bit further forward, give him a chance to attack some more. And I think that with the depth that we've got in our squad now is... Parker, is he going to stick with his usual way of having the same team week in, week out? Or do you think maybe now, given how many plays he's got, he might switch it up when it needs to? That 
is an amazing question <laughs> and i think we will find out to be honest because i wouldn't want to even second guess that and i think it's a lovely point at which to end so that everyone can spend the international break thinking about what they would do um brilliant stuff thank you for all your comments and questions on the live video if you're listening to this on the podcast we do um we do most weeks broadcast the podcast live on on my social media channels so if you want to get involved then do so likewise we may even do a full q a version uh, over the coming weeks as well but that is it that is time for the 78th edition of on the ball the norris city podcast that could probably do with a a, a bit of sleep uh, if you're yet to do so make sure you subscribe via your podcast player of choice the pod is available free for everyone on your usual player and we are now streaming the recording of the podcast live as i mentioned in video form on my social media channels just search michael bailey the athletic norris city and your preferred social platform and hopefully all being well it will show up uh, ratings and reviews whenever prompted are always hugely appreciated and if you want to get in touch with any questions or topic proposals send me a direct message on twitter at michael j uh, michael j bailey mentioning the podcast um but that is it a, a big thank you to our wonderful guest tonight steve thank you so much for your time pleasure michael thank you phil um well done good to see you what a superstar anna what a wonderful debut well done did you enjoy it Absolutely. Hoping this isn't a first and last. Oh, well, I was going to say, will you come on again? Of course. I love it. See? Nailed it. Brilliant stuff. Well done, Anna. Top work. Uh, we will be back in two weeks for loads more Canaries carry on <laughs> in another on the ball. I've got to stop laughing after that bit. Uh, another on the ball Norwich City podcast uh, as we do take a break during the international break. Until then, never mind the danger. And I've forgotten to play the outro, which now goes now. And we're clear. Well, that was a seamless end as I uh, forgot to play the video at the end. I got quite excited and carried away with myself. Um, Steve, Phil, Anna, all you Twitterkers out there, welcome to Wits End. If any of you have stumbled across this for the first time and are wondering what the hell is going on and why the podcast hasn't actually ended, listen to On The Ball podcast number 42, which went live on September the 8th, 2020. We're almost at the an the uh, first birthday of this. Uh, it's all explained there. Anyway, uh, you can email this bonus part of the podcast directly, Twitterkers, Twitter, K-E-R-S at iCloud.com, or use the hashtag Twitterkers on Twitter. Just don't explain what it refers to, because this is a secret club for only ye who discover it, um, which we all have. Uh, Steve, bold move not to go with And We're Clear last week. Uh, I can't even remember what I did say. I no, just I knew I didn't want to say, and we're clear, because I thought <laughs> that would be... You might have some sort of copyright down on that. I just wanted to... Cause, um, because you mentioned Anna's baseball jacket earlier, I wanted to... I know, I know that obviously our listeners can't see this, but um, Phil, Mr. Phil Daly is, is wearing a hoodie with what looks like daily written on the oh god it's got your name so on it phil i just wondered if phil if everything phil wears has his name on it or if it's, this is just a special piece of attire no you, you were right the first time yes they all do <laughs> just in case <laughs> you know who i am yeah. <laughs> this, this looks like football training wear phil it is yeah this is um sporting longdale oh. uh, sunday league team hoodie from circa about 15 years ago, ripped apart, but, you know, still got a lot of love for sporting Longdale reserves. <laughs> that makes a lot more sense now. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I always I always played on a Sunday because I couldn't really handle the competitive nature of a Saturday. Best week in the world, <laughs> Michael. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be said. Um, and that's good. Dre dressing like a new dad there, Phil. I fully appreciate that. So that's a good word. I'm, I'm just Whack dressed. That's, yes. That's, yeah. that's, that's all that matters. <laughs> what more does anyone want for a live video? Never mind audio sure. dulcet if, tones. If you, if you look like Matthias Norman, apparently you don't need to wear any clothes. I think that was what you're insinuating in earlier michael so. i think <laughs> I, I stand by my previous statement um <laughs> now we did have uh, we did have an email um which i've got ready it was from chandler Ellsbecker. hello chandler hope all's good he sent that email to twitterkers at icloud.com um make sure you will send that uh, to us as well because then you can uh, obviously get in touch with us here on this section of the pod um 
he was uh, saying, Michael and company, I'm, I'm, I'm a little weeks late on this, but felt obligated to note that not every podcast concerning Norwich has had to take its title from the words to On the Ball City, which was something we mentioned. Um, the first I listened to was John and Dan's Little Yellow Bird podcast. And mm. as far as I know, someone other than me listened to it. That's true. I used to listen to it. As Whatever well. happened to them? Chandler. I don't know, really. I hope they were right. Mm. Uh, he says, I still sing and somewhere that's not Norwich in my head in regard to away games. I don't remember that bit, but we'll have to ask John and Dan about that next time we're on. Um, and then he said some nice words. So, yeah, thanks, Chandler. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there we go. Um, that's good. That's good. Uh, good to know. It's a good. We, we poached them in the end because they, you know, didn't didn't want to do it, and we thought we'd have them. So that was a success. Anyway, um, <laughs> that, that almost sounded like sarcastic the way you said that. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a personal weakness that I say things sincerely that sounds sarcastic. I must admit. Um, any 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 random stuff anyone wants to bring up uh, before we 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 diss off? Um, can end? I bring I, up? Can I bring up something? Um, yes, please. The halftime entertainment, um, we appear to have just given up on that now. It's like Tampa time. Should we just do a quiz? Um, you know, not even what happened to like zorbing or you know, even kicking the ball to the center circle. So, um, oh, can I bring up something on that? Go on, then, go on, then, Anna. I just like what's your opinions on this. One of the questions on there was who scored the winning goal against Leicester the last, last time we oh, played yeah. them. I think everybody should know that. The, the guy from the went, oh, that was James Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, hey, who's James Lewis? <laughs> that should be someone. Is he like, a, you know, is he a did, star actor or something like that? I think I don't know the name. Thing is, though, did they give it to him? No, no, no. They, okay, they well, they could have done. They could have gone. Well, yes, that's close enough. No, I think um, um, Dan Dan Wynn was very quite scathing. Well, no, no. Yeah. Not the name. What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you doing here if you don't know that question? Um, um, that's so good I thought, because I, I sorry, Steve, I, I sort of have to, I disappear into the press room to definitely not get just a hot drink and a cake, but to obviously catch the TV stuff and have a conversation with people. So I sort of missed the halftime on. Uh, uh, sort of entertainment and then come back out while it's in full flow and i i sort of picked up oh they're just asking questions about Literally norwich versus awesome. leicester and yeah. and some of them felt a bit like oh that that's not a good memory <laughs> why would all the norwich fans want to know that so i got a bit confused but yeah sorry carry on well i just i wanted to know what would people like to see as the halftime entertainment if we could have anything i what mean i always like the crossbar challenge and that yeah. was kind of yes. classic, oh, yeah, wasn't that's it? Right. so maybe bring that back but i don't know if there's any like novelty ones like i don't know some kind of royal rumble in the center circle that would be fun for 15 <laughs> minutes wouldn't it what just just let i don't know if anyone's got any thoughts maybe get delia out there again wheel her out no thank you um, well, I, 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 I guess the ground the grounds the grounds men and women uh, don't like people on the pitch more yeah, than they have. On. Now, do you know what? While we're talking about this, I've always had an issue with this, right? Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Right. <laughs> what, why is there an issue of someone wearing like trainers being on the pitch when in a few minutes' time, 22 men with studs are going to kick the hell out of each other? Okay. It's sliding challenge, mm -hmm. sliding on their knees when they score. Yeah. Oh, no, you're going on there in some smart shoes. You're going to damage the pitch. Come is on. there a story here, Phil? Is there a story <laughs> that you tried to get on the pitch in smart shoes? Sort of pitches I play on have got broken bottles and dog poo. So, you know, I'm, you know. <laughs> that, that, I've, I've never seen Phil um, uncoil as quickly as just then. <laughs> that was like your moment, Phil. You were ready to go. I just that. don't understand it. Um, yeah, I wonder, you know, maybe some zorbing. That was always fun. I've done zorbing. Right. It's hideous to do, but much more funny to watch. Uh, I mean, Millwall seem to do this thing where, um, well, they do lots of things you wouldn't want to do, but this thing they did was um, a, a sort of a relay race with kids supporters around the perimeter of the pitch. Oh, right. And they always seem to pair it up. So there was like a, a, a three-year-old away fan kid having to run the last leg against some 12-year-old <laughs> teenager. So obviously Millwall always won. That was what seemed to Brilliant happen. Idea. I mean, I something that. that Norwich could could fix so that at the start of the second half, everyone is pumped because we don't want to see the Sheffield United defeat again, do we? You know, we want to see everyone pumped because the halftime entertainment actually doubled up as a massive motivational exercise. QPR, I, I think it was QPR. It was definitely an away game I went to a few years ago. Did uh, like the dizzy penalties thing you do? You know, when you like put your head on a yes. pole and spin around ten times, and you have to go and you have to go and score a goal. That was fantastic because essentially you're just laughing at um, somebody, who's, uh, some middle-aged bloke who's who's like, right, I'm gonna get on the pitch. This is gonna live my dream, 
and then it, it all goes horribly on because they fall over before they even get to the ball or something. That is a, well, we used to do that at Mustard TV back in the day, and that was great fun. We used to we used to get local uh, all the sort of non-league teams to to do it in a competition with each other, and that was loads of fun. So yeah, they should they should do that, Carol. Pitch. I mean, I wonder if there's something they could do maybe with the players who aren't in the match day squad. I've got to know. I've Wheel them out and get them to do something hilarious oh, on the pitch. I'm not that one. I, I think it might be <laughs> not that one. <laughs> well, no, no, this is much less dignified. Um, <laughs> I think this it might be in baseball where there is um, one of the, the, the grounds, I don't know what you call it, a baseball ground. You have like um, someone who is a sprinter and a member, a fan comes on and has to try and beat them in a race, but they get like half the distance head start. Shemi Poketa, not in the starting lineup. <laughs> yeah, you got to do it up, the, up of the pitch. COVID. You get half the, half the lap head start. You've got to beat him in a race. Give win, a, a, win a trip Give to Tampa. That's great. Uh, Covid stricken Shemik, as if he's not got enough on his plate. He's gonna, you, you're gonna get a 200 meter head start and see if you can beat him in a sprint. Love that. Yeah. Wait, you know what? If it gets the Barkley roaring, then I think uh, we can do. I mean, uh, maybe live projection of the. Of the scenes inside the home dressing room, imagine that just a video with all the sound, so we all get to listen to the halftime. I've always team. wanted to know because I've what just bring that up. I've always wanted to know what goes on in there because Farquhar seems like a man who keeps it all very calm on the surface, but some you know it's just kind of bubbling under there. So I, I just want to know: does he ever go absolutely mad at them in the dressing room? He is, he's, I mean, that was the one thing about all of the behind closed doors football I watched. Some of it quite close to the dugout and Phil may appreciate this as well, but he is so lovely to talk to so often. When he's in the technical area, he is miserable and angry. I mean, he's a really miserable, angry man. And the amount of times he turns around, you know, muttering, if not swearing, is remarkable. So, um, so yeah. We can't forget what the what throwing what moment. One of my favourite moments from him, the... Oh, the uh, yes, the Dimi Yanulis impression. Is quite, will go down in in history. Um, and yeah, I think uh, I think that's probably a good note to end the podcast on. Um, I do have to ask this. I mean, if anyone wants to get in touch with any of this stuff, by the way, um, you know how to get us. You can email us, um, which is twitterkers at icloud.com you could just send a tweet with the hashtag twitter because don't have to tag any of us in we'll we'll pick it up don't worry uh, make sure you check out uh, the the website of course twitterkers.co.uk it's been such a busy deadline day transfer window i haven't had a chance to check in on the website so apologies to the guys there but i'm looking forward to having a look at that once everything's a bit more normal the other side of the international break that'll be grand so check that out twitterkers.co.uk anyone got uh any other business mm, i think no. so which is fine. Um, we'll let Kenny rest. He's got a busy weekend, of course, um, up, on, on going with Scotland. So therefore, it just leaves me to say, uh, everyone, can you just say goodbye on three, please? One, two, three. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Look at that. That was absolutely seamless. Uh, and I'm going to say goodbye to him there. I'm going to mute them all. And that's the way that that rolls. Um, thanks to all the guys. Um, remember, get in touch with us on, on Wits End. Uh, send us an email. But other than that, thanks for listening to the pod. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. That's a rup. And that really is a rup. Um, what, how brilliant were Phil, Steve and Anna? That was uh, absolutely lovely. Thank you to all you guys and girls out there watching on the video. Hope uh, you uh, enjoyed your Monday evening. It's been a remarkable 48, 24 hours in terms of Norwich's transfer window. It's been a long time since they've done this kind of business late in the window uh, to the point where it caught me out. It's the last time I'm going to book uh the two days before the transfer window um deadline day off i can tell you that much um but uh there we go um that was good fun um i'm gonna try and do a green room q a later in the international break at some point to so keep an eye on the social feeds for that and we'll do a proper q a session because i know there's so many questions you guys will want to ask and uh and um, get answers to so i'll make sure we sort that out um, keep an eye on the athletic. Uh, there's some. Um, I've got an interview to go up, hopefully, over the international break, and a couple of other uh, pieces as well. So keep an eye on that. And I think I'm done. As I said, we'll be back on on the ball on the Monday after the Arsenal game, which I have to say, uh, I find a remarkable circumstance uh, to to um, to uh, watch and cover. So I'll be looking forward to that very much. Thank you all, everyone. Have a lovely Monday evening, and of course, you rest of your international break. And uh, I'll see you very soon. Until then. Bye.